Well, happy Sabbath. Uh, before we begin uh, this study, can you join me in a word of prayer? Uh, dear, gracious Heavenly Father, we invite your presence as once again we open your word as we look at the crisis that faces us. We know that character is not developed in a crisis, but is revealed. We ask, Lord, that we can develop a Christ-like character in the present time so that we can be prepared. We pray for your angels to watch over each one, that your Holy Spirit works upon our hearts, and that we can have an influence for good in this world. And we invite your presence now, and we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, good morning, everyone. And uh, we're going to continue looking at uh, uh, Robert Olson's The Crisis Ahead, which is a compilation that we studied in the upper room uh, back in 1985-86, in that time period that, um, that I was a part of the upper room studies in the attic of the house I grew up in. Uh, Kelly was there for another year or so after I left, and um, so this was studied at the time I was there. And it was something that uh, really struck me. There's so many statements in the spirit of prophecy. Back then, of course, we didn't have the LNG white disc and we didn't have the internet. I had the three index to the writings of Ellen White, the three volumes, and I had a smattering of spirit of prophecy books at that time. I'd only been an Adventist for a short while. Eventually did accumulate all of her books, but uh, at that time I had some so a compilation like this was really valuable for me uh, to bring statements that uh, I might not have noticed. Of course, most of these are uh, the common things, the testimonies, prophets and kings, um, you know, great controversy statements. They're not a bunch of obscure statements. Nowadays, we can find things in the letters and the manuscripts and in some of these uh, less known books. Uh, things like the Spalding Collection and things like that. Uh, but back then, we didn't really have as many resources. So it was nice to have a compilation like this. Now, of course, you know, we don't have the context for all of these statements. Um, and that's a bad thing about a compilation is uh, it's nicer to see, you know, what who she's writing to and what uh, the what she's writing about in the in the larger context. But uh there's still lots here that we can see. Now, he has done this in, in a question and answer format. And um, and we can see here that, uh, you know, are the inhabitants of heaven aware of our coming conflict? And then he's going to have a statement from 5T. And we know that those that are in heaven are uh, looking with inexpressible interest to the closing work of the great controversy between Christ and Satan. And um, and we, we can see uh, why they would. I mean, we live in interesting times. It's not very pleasant, but they, uh, and there is a Bible verse, you know, talks about this as well. Uh, you know, especially the people in the past uh, who, you know, the prophets and so forth uh, have spoke of our time. Now, of course, the inhabitants of the earth, the question is, are they equally aware of impending events? Uh, a Testimonies 28 and 7 Bible Commentary 911. We who know the truth should be preparing for, for what is soon to break upon the world as an overwhelming surprise. So the world is not going to be aware of these things that, um, I mean, they can see sort of something is happening, but What's going to happen and how fast it's going to happen uh, is going to catch uh, people unawares. Now, I remember, uh, you know, after COVID happened, going to the grocery store, um, you know, we have a grocery store called uh, um, the Real Canadian uh, Superstore. Uh, so it's a big grocery store. And everybody appeared to be in shock. This is before we had the mask mandate so we just had people wandering around the store sort of wide-eyed um with you know very little expression other than just surprise maybe and and 
<coughs> excuse me, and 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 shock of what what is happening, like because it seemed very surreal, and and that definitely did catch them by surprise. But they will be surprised again as these events continue to unfold. Uh, Christians should be preparing for what is soon to break upon the world as an overwhelming surprise. And this preparation they should make by diligently studying the word of God and striving to conform their lives to its precepts. God calls for a revival and a reformation. Now, uh, this is Prophets and Kings 626. Now, that is what we have been doing, um, both as a group and as individuals, is diligently studying the word of God. And it's not so that we can um, satisfy human curiosity, so that we can win debates with others, so that we can prove ourselves right and others wrong. Uh, the reason that we are doing that is we want to conform our lives to its teachings. And we recognize that a revival, which means to make alive again, and a reformation, uh, which means to uh, to reform or set everything uh, sort of straight again, organize things again, that this revival and reformation, that they have to go together. If you have a revival without a reformation, it's, uh, you know, you're bringing people to lives with, to life, but with nothing for them to do. And if you have a reformation without a revival of the spirit, it just becomes form, right? So, and, and anybody can comment on these things as we're going through this, if you have any thoughts on this. Do we as Seventh-day Adventists have a true appreciation of the crisis ahead? And of course, this is one thing um, that we have to really take into account. Ellen White says, the time of trouble such as never was, is soon to open upon us and we shall need an experience which we do not now possess and which many are too indolent to obtain. It is often the case that trouble is greater in anticipation than in reality, but this is not true of the crisis before us. The most vivid presentation cannot reach the magnitude of the ordeal, Great Controversy 622. So if we think about this, uh, the indolence that, uh, that we're so prone to naturally in our human nature to do as little as we can to preserve our energy. And yet, you know, we need to put our energies to obtain something that we need for the future. And that is a Christ-like character. And in order to go through this crisis, uh, you know, as I said earlier, crisis does not uh, develop a character, right? Christ, a crisis demonstrates the type of character that we have. And, and so we have to think about the little things that happen each day, that the things that we we, we sort of dismiss as unimportant, but which, which really are, are very important. The time we spend in prayer, um, the time we spend studying his word and contemplating his word uh, to develop a character in the little things of life, uh, to do what is right, even when our nature is, is trying to tell us, you know, not to. Those things are needful now. God is merciful now. There's no doubt about it. But at some point, his mercy uh, will no longer plead with humanity. And we don't want to be on the other side of that. We are now on the verge of the time of trouble and perplexities that are scarcely dreamed of, uh, or and perplexities that are scarcely dreamed of are before us. Um so I think as Seventh-day Adventists, we, you know, we some ways can be sort of asleep to what's hap what's going to happen. We should have woken up in 1989. We should have woken up at 9/11. Um, we should have woken up uh, when the pandemic hit. And and sometimes we're sort of startled from our bed, uh, but then we go back to sleep. 
I know when I was in Australia, I would, I would have to get up in the middle of the night to join the meetings. And, and one time, I, I guess, and I don't even remember it, but I must have just turned off my my alarm and it just went back to sleep and I just missed it, missed the study. Um, and that's how we sometimes are when these things come and sort of startle us awake. Uh, but we, you know, we close the eyes, fold the hands and, uh, you know, a little slumber, a little sleep and, uh, and destruction comes a upon little us. folding of the hands. Yeah. Yeah. So why, um, so is it possible for Christians to be unprepared for coming trouble in spite of previous warnings? Now, we're giving here some Bible verses. Uh, Mark. I eight. had a comment. Yeah. <clears throat> Sorry, I'll interrupt. Uh, just a comment before you go on about yeah. the uh, um, being woken from our beds and just going back to sleep. That was my experience on the morning of 9 11. Because I'd been on night shift all week, I usually, well, I would work from from 5 p.m. till till you know 6 6 p.m. till 4 a.m. and I'd come home and be up still and go to sleep. So my sister called me and woke me up. Turn on your TV, and I looked and I see what's happening. And I just groggily said to my sister, "Well, thanks for calling, Amber. We know these things are going to happen. I got to go back to sleep." And I went back to sleep, and as I laid my head down, <laughs> I didn't watch the TV all day. I was tired, um, but also because I knew things like that would happen, and I laid my head down, I said, God, is, if this is the end of the world, uh, please help me. And I went back to sleep. <laughs> okay, so maybe you were typical of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. I'm thinking. <laughs> <laughs> well, hopefully, all, hopefully well and, and when... When Peter first started coming over in 2011 with his stack of books, talking to me about the 2520 and so on, yeah. I would fall asleep. I would sit there in the chair in my in my my house and fall asleep, and Peter would just carry on studying. I don't know if he noticed my head nodding out or not, but yeah. there was one or two others that would join us sometimes, and I'd wake up at the end of that study and, okay, well, I guess it's time to go, and it wasn't until... Uh, well, I didn't pay a lot of attention to it. It was your phone call that prompted me. Yeah. Why didn't you tell me about this before? Yeah, I know. That's, well, that's probably. Yeah. Okay. So, so yeah. Up. So, um, so Mark 8, verse 31, he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected of the elders and of the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. And he spake that saying openly. And Peter took him and began to rebuke him. So one one of the things that that we see is that people have an abhorrence to the cross. That as Christians want to have a good, you know, and happy life, um, you know, so we become Christians thinking it's all going to be, you know, wonderful to be a Christian. But you know, we have all of these. I'm just looking at these other verses see whether I need to read them all or not. Um, but but that's the part of it is that we often uh, shun the cross. In uh, another one, verse there, that's uh, Mark 10, verse 32 to 34, where Jesus talks of his death and saying, Behold, we go up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man shall be delivered to the chief priests, etc. So, but they were amazed, right, the disciples. So Jesus keeps telling them, you know, and they're amazed that he's going to Jerusalem. And they were afraid, right? So he, he keeps telling them and reminding them of, of these things that are going to happen. And now they give us, I think these are pretty much going to be the same types of things. You know, Matthew 26, 56. Jesus says, but all this was done that the scriptures of the prophets might be fulfilled. And all the disciples forsook him and fled. And Luke 24, verse 6 to 8. Um, this is just dealing with the time of the resurrection. He is 
not here, but is risen. Remember how he spake unto you when he was yet in Galilee, saying, The Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified, and the third day rise again. And they remembered his words. Right. So, I mean, we need to take heed to these things now. So the disciples were totally, were they totally unprepared? Um, is the question that uh, he asks here. Great Controversy 594. They could not tolerate the thought that he, in whom all their hopes centered, should suffer an ignominious death. The words which they needed to remember were banished from their minds. And when the time of trial came, it found them unprepared. The death of Jesus as fully destroyed their hopes as if he had not forewarned them. Peter did not desire to see the cross in the work of Christ. And, and I think as Christians, we like to dwell upon God's mercy because he is merciful and he has been merciful to us. But he has a purpose for his mercy because he wants to develop the character of Christ in us. And, and so that cross that we have to take up, it's not pleasant, you know. Yoking up with Christ, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I'm meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. It doesn't mean that it's going to be light for us. Early writings 120. There's a sentence there. I saw that God's people are on enchanted ground and that some have lost nearly all sense of the shortness of time and the worth of the soul. Uh, before that is actually five testimonies, seven, sixteen. I have a nice complica complication of com <laughs> complication of compl compilations, <clears throat> uh, oh, yeah. preparation for the final crisis. But anyway, uh, if God has ever spoken by me, the time will come when you will be brought before councils, and every position of truth which you hold will be severely criticized. The time that so many are now allowing to go to waste should be devoted to the charge that God has given us of preparing for the approaching crisis. Yeah. The Lord will have a, have a people as true as steel and with faith as firm as a granite rock. They are to be the witness to the world. His instrumentality is to do a special, a glorious work in the day of his preparation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so just like Peter did not desire to see the cross in the work of Christ, I think for many of us, we're the same as Peter. Enchanted um, ground. That, what yeah. that means, I'm not sure, but God's people are on enchanted ground. Well, yeah, they're, they're, that, that's sort of from Pilgrim's Progress, I believe. Um, the idea that uh, we're on Satan's ground and we're on the ground of the world and we become caught up in the cares of this life rather than in eternal realities. Has the Lord given us a clear outline of events connected with the close of probation? So the events connected with the close of probation and the work of preparation for the time of trouble are clearly presented. But multitudes have no more understanding of these important truths than if they had never been revealed. So just as she says about the disciples, it's as if he never warned them. And we have the same situation. Uh, in this world today. He has a chart pointing out every way, Mark, on the heavenly heavenward journey, and he ought not to guess at anything. So um, in the context of this movement, we, we can see uh, the significance of these statements that I wouldn't have seen in the upper room, you know, back in, uh, well, 39 years ago. We are to see in history the fulfillment of prophecy to study the workings of providence in the great reformatory movements and to understand the progress of events in the marshalling of the nations for the final conflict of the great controversy. So these are the things that we have been studying. You know, part of, uh, you know, my discussions when I was in Australia, I know Felix wanted to be here, but he had such a, a hard week. He, you know, you'd have to it'd be really early in the morning, Sunday morning for him to be here, but uh, he wants to join in these studies. But this is something that we discussed quite often. 
was, you know, why are we studying what we're studying in the sense of, you know, chronology and all of these events, these form lines, these way marks, these are things that are clearly presented in God's word. That is, when we look at history, we see the fulfillment of prophecy. We can see that these are the great reformatory movements. And, and we need to understand the progress of events, right? And in the marshalling of the nations for the final conflicts of the great controversy, that's what we have been studying. So it's, we're not been wasting our time uh, studying these things. You know, some people say, well, you're wasting your time. You need to study, you know, the third angel's message uh, of righteousness by faith. Uh, really not understanding what that is. Yeah, Kelly. Mm. Oh, I was just clearing my throat, but actually, oh, okay. Okay. you you were saying you were saying something uh, just now. That it'll come to me. Carry on, please. Okay. Does this mean that we can understand every single detail of anticipated events before they come to pass? So we have this from Six Testimonies, page seventeen, and uh, it's in Eight Testimonies, one fifty nine. The mark of the beast is exactly what it has been proclaimed to be. Not all in regard to this matter is yet understood, nor will it be understood until the unrolling of the scroll, which is interesting. And then um, from Review and Herald, uh, December 24th, 1889. Uh, much of these things has been shown, much upon these things has been shown to me. I can only present a few ideas to you. Go to God for yourselves. Pray for divine enlightenment that you may know that you do know what is truth, that when the powerful miracle working power of Satan shall be displayed and the enemy shall come as an angel of light, you may distinguish between the genuine work of God and the imitative work of the power of darkness. Now, uh, it would be nice to see a bit more of the context what she's talking about these things but uh one thing we can see here going back to the other statement the unrolling of the scroll ellen white says you know we cannot know the time you know of, of all these events but we need to be watching and waiting and i believe that uh the watching and waiting is the recognition of these way marks uh, that we have been passing through but also we know that there is an unrolling of the scroll. That, so what is that a reference to? The unrolling of the scroll. What scroll is this that's being unrolled? What she, what she talk is it Daniel? No. Well, I would think it has to be Daniel, right? That that's yeah. that's the only book that's... that I can think of that would be that would apply here. Now we know that Daniel is unsealed in the book of Revelation, and we can see that. Uh, you know, we see this scroll sealed with seven seals and the seven seals are, you know, the first four deal with the fall of Western Rome. And then the fifth and sixth deal with the fall of Eastern Rome, right, in connection with Islam. And then we have the seventh seal, which has to deal with it deals with the fall of modern Rome. And, and there's this sort of controversy, I guess, that I never knew about. You know, what is modern Rome? Well, we know that the papacy is, and, and, and this point, um, so I'm trying to go back to the conversation I had with Colin yesterday. So, uh, and, and we're going to talk about this in, in our morning studies. But basically the idea is that we have uh, pagan Rome, that is, it's going to give the papacy its power, seat, and great authority, right? And that's going to be the papacy right. is the beast of Revelation 13 that comes out of the sea. And then you're going to see a beast come out of the earth. And this beast is going to create an image to the beast. Now, that's going to be uh, the United States rising in 1798. And it has two horns. One is Protestantism and one is Republicanism. Right. The Protestant horn is going to fall in Millerite history. The Republican horn falls in our history, and it's going to speak as a dragon. It has horns like a lamb, 
but it speaks as a dragon. So the United States is a parallel to pagan Rome. We see this, A.T. Jones in his book, The Two Republics, compares the United States with Rome, uh, showing that these two republics, that that pagan Rome typifies the United States. And and we can see how this this is at the end of the world, just as uh, the power seat and great authority of pagan Rome is given to papal Rome. In our history, it's the United States that is going to be the one that brings in the Sunday law, that creates the image to the beast, right? <clears throat> People are going to worship the image to the beast. Uh, oh, yeah. Great. Uh, at the start of what you were reading, 1798, when the USA begins to, or the papacy goes out of sight and the mm-hmm. USA rises up. But that, mm-hmm. is that the beginning of the formation of the image to the beast or? It's when they renounce the Constitution that the yeah. U.S. Yeah, it's later. Becomes the image. Yeah, yeah, it's later, right? Because they create an image That's of the beast. What I, thought. I just wanted to. But but there are. I just wanted. There, yeah, there and and the United States has the institutions. Uh, there's another book, um, uh, which I can never remember the title of, but it, it's a history. It was written by a. Um, sociologist about uh, the Seventh-day Adventist Church where it shows that the Seventh-day Adventist Church has basically uh, created a parallel institutions to the United States. We, we have our own medical system, we have our own educational system, you know, our uh, the general conference offices are, you know, not in Washington, D.C., but definitely very close to Washington, D.C. That's where the center of the church is. And, even and, the architecture, and we, even the architecture of the two cities, the city of Rome and the city of Washington. Yeah. DC. So, so, so the Seventh-day Adventist the Church has copied the United States, and the United States has copied, copied Rome, right? Like there is this this copying going on, and um, I'm not saying that uh, the Seventh-day Adventist Church is Babylon or anything like that, but I'm saying that there is this 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 modeling after Rome that the United States does and the Adventist church does this as well. So, and, and it's something that in we what way? To understand. What's that? In in what way is the SDA church doing that? It models its institutions. You know, it has, it has a parallel to the institutions that exist within the United States. You know, things even like pathfinders, you know, that models, you know, itself after boy scouts, Boy Scouts, right? You know, so, you know, but it's this copying that goes on. The United States itself has this copying characteristic, which is a Roman characteristic. That is, Rome copied the nations that it conquered to some degree, right? It's it's a syncretistic power. It, It didn't overthrow the gods of the nations that it conquered. Per se, right? It it didn't overthrow their cultures. It, it incorporated that. And the Catholic Church does the same thing, and the United Ch- the United States has copied Rome, and the Seventh Day Adventist Church has copied the United States. That's all I'm saying. But there's a lot of copying going on, and and we are to copy uh, Christ. So when we when we copy the world, is, is yeah. one of the ways the church copies things is to have a president of a general conference because i know if i remember right ellen white didn't want a president of the general conference she wanted a, a group president of yeah yeah uh, she says here of uh of uh butler when the men at the 1888 conference were not wanting to discuss things because he wasn't here or there now the message she says the message is coming from your president at Battle Creek, or cal- calculated to stir you up. It's interesting mm-hmm. how she says to your president, not our president, or the you know, our president of <laughs> your yeah. president. Yeah, it, it's, so not it's one so, way the church is well, it says, mod- it says, modeled after the institutions of the I don't know modern world. Yeah, um, what's the Bible verse that addresses that? To have a king over us. No, 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 
I'm not thinking of that. You wanted a king. It's in the New Testament. I uh, just can't think what the verse, how it goes. But basically, we're not supposed to be like the Gentiles where, you know, we have, you know, lords, right? Rulers that, 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 you know, we are servants. That's the role of the Christian, not to have these high p- positions of power. But yet, you know, humanity, uh, you know, loves power, at least certain people in humanity love power. So, um, so we see this exercised within the church. So, uh, the point that I'm trying to bring out is that, um, we have this, uh, these events that, that have occurred in the past and we need to understand how they apply in the present. So the unrolling of the scroll, which is what we were talking about in the book of Daniel, we have Millerite history has been sealed up in the seven thunders. And the purpose of this movement was to unseal the seven thunders, right? That That's, yep. understand yep. Millerite history. Much of these things has been shown to me. I can only present a few ideas, right? So Ellen White says that there is some things that she she knows but there are things that she couldn't present so why can she only present a few ideas why does she why do we have to well, study I, I think of a few things one uh they weren't ready to receive it the other is to point them to the word of god to establish their own faith mm-hmm. and uh yeah and it wasn't time I think part of it is not the time, but but because we have to we have to go through an experience to really understand these things. Um, so the question then here, this is going to have a number of different uh, statements to answer. It. How important is it for us to study the prophecies which relate to the last days? So that's a question that was asked when I was in Australia, you know, sometimes, of course, you know, do we need to know all these details of chronology and so forth? And and sometimes the question is, is this salvational? Shouldn't I just know about Christ? How come I have to know about all these prophecies? Um, and the, the question that we should always ask ourselves about something is, is it salvational is kind of a bad question because it all depends on the context in which we receive it. If if light comes to us and we reject it, that life was light was salvational to us, right? If if we reject it for the wrong reasons, you know, not just because we don't understand it. Um, so you know, knowingly reject light and not understand things. What's that? To knowingly reject light. So yeah, you're... right. Yeah. So mm-hmm. so to knowingly reject light because it, it you know that it can be for us salvational. The question we always need to ask ourselves is not whether it's salvational or not, but whether it's true or not. That's the question we should always ask. Is it true? Because if it's truth, we want to hear it. We, you know, we're not going to say, well, I'm only interested in the truth that's salvational and all this other truth that I don't have to worry about. Uh, you know, I'll leave that up to the theologians. Right. Um, and I don't think that that's how God's word works. So it's important for us to study the prophecies. As we near the close of this world's history, the prophecies relating to the last days especially demand our study. Christ's Object Lessons 133. Uh, 6T 129 says they should know the things that will come to pass before the closing up of the world's history. These things concern our eternal welfare, and teachers and students should give more attention to them. In early writings 118, I then saw the third angel, said, my accompanying angel, fearful is his work, awful is his mission. He is the angel that is to select the wheat from the tares and seal or bind the wheat for the heavenly gardener. These things should engross the whole mind, the whole attention. And uh, fundamentals of, I'm I'm not sure F.E. what F.E. is. I don't know if that's fundamentals of Christian education or not. Um, 526 and 527. In the night season, these words were spoken to me. Charge the teachers in our schools to prepare the students for what is coming upon the world. 
and in this next statement, but there is a day that God hath appointed for the close of this world's history. So there is a day, right? There is, God hasn't revealed it to us yet. We don't know it. Uh, this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. Prophecy is fast fulfilling. More, much more should be said about these tremendously important subjects. Now that's, again, Fundamentals of Education, 335. And then 5T, 716. Let the watchmen now lift up their voice and give the message which is present truth for this time. Let us show the people where we are in prophetic history. Now, we can see that that's what we've been doing with the lines. So, you know, Seventh-day Adventists, the general average everyday Seventh-day Adventists, they just kind of know that there's going to be a Sunday law someday. But they don't know where they are in prophetic history. They don't know where we are in our reform lines. They don't know November 9th, 1989 is the time of the end for this generation. They, they don't understand uh, 9-11 and its role in pro prophecy. They, they can't tell what it is we just passed through with the pand pandemic, what part that plays in prophecy. Um, there's so much that they don't understand uh, that they could understand, right? If they took the time uh, to understand you know, where we are in prophetic history. And it's the watchmen who are, that have to lift up their voice and give the message, which is present truth for this time. And, and we would be watchmen, right? This is our role, our responsibility. Now, you know, there's a guy who comments on my vid uh, videos. He calls himself Enoch, and he says he's the watchman. Um, he has a lot of false understanding of prophecy. Um, but at least he's he's trying to warn people, right? So we're not supposed to wait till we have everything, you know, all together. Uh, we're, we're to show what's in God's word and warn people of what's to come. Great pains should be taken to keep this subject before the people. The solemn fact is to be kept not only before the people of the world, but before our own churches also, that the day of the Lord will come suddenly, unexpectedly. The fearful warning of the prophecy is addressed to every soul. Let no one feel that he is secure from the danger of being surprised. Let no one's interpretation of prophecy rob you of the conviction of the knowledge of events which show that this great event is near at hand. Now, are there people who rob us of the interpretation of the prophecy that this great event, event the coming of Christ, is near at hand? Are there, are there Adventists doing that, robbing people of the conviction of the knowledge of events which show that the great event is near at hand? Yes. Yes. Right. Amen. I'm, um, I'm, I'm hearing the message in the, threads, you know, that I'm hearing in, hearing people comment in, in, on social media that, yes, Jesus is coming again, but not not in this generation. The Sunday law, it will happen, but not while I'm alive. Really? Putting off into the future. Yeah. Yeah. It's, yeah. See, actually, I've heard it quite a few times now. Yeah. Yeah, it's pretty crazy. I mean, I've heard it too, but, you know. And, and of course, they say, well, you know, people have been saying, you know, that this president's going to bring the Sunday law, you know, for ever since I've been an Adventist, which actually I don't think is true. I don't really remember that uh, happening before. Um, and, uh, they, as an Adventist, and as an and as an Adventist, uh, we should one day try to brainstorm and think of how many presidents – Seventh day Adventists have said this about. Well, I, I don't remember people saying about previous presidents to be no, honest. Did, uh, I, yeah. What's that what did you say you didn't believe? Hmm? The the last question what you said a few minutes ago. I don't know. <laughs> Never said anything about not believing something. I, I mean um about John about um the president. I'm just saying that you know, we never talked about the presidents bringing in the Sunday law. You know, any particular president that I remember. 
right. you know, nobody was saying, oh, Bill Clinton's going to bring in the Sunday law, unless I missed it, you know. Oh, okay. Um, I, I think I, I, it's, it's a more modern idea. We focused I more on the papacy in the 1990s. It was more about the Pope, what the Pope was doing, and what the religious right was doing. It wasn't really a focus upon a particular president. I have faint memories when Reagan re- it was or, you know when Reagan reappointed a political ambassador to the papacy. There was talk with the people I was talking with in the in the church that that might be the president. Well, it wasn't so much the president though, right? Because I remember that Whoa. it wasn't so much the, focused on the president. It was focused upon the papacy sort of taking over the United States is the way that it was understood back then. The focus was always the papacy, right? That we let the papacy... Well, without the, but that, that president the, being... There would be, and that, no, 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 that wasn't the president. It would be the that, religious... That it would party. happen during that time. Yeah. Well, it was the act of Reagan of bringing the in the... But not because of the president, but because of the religious right was going to, you know, cause this sort of grassroots sort of takeover of the United States is the way that I understood it in the past, where now we talk okay, about the way that I understood it. <laughs> Hold on. My turn. Yeah. Well, I have to Hold finish on, what my, I was my saying. <laughs> okay. I'm sorry. I was interrupting you. Yeah. Um, yeah. No, the, the way I saw it was that it was, he was the president in power. It wasn't that he was going to do it, but that, it was mm-hmm. going to happen during his presidency. Mm-hmm. Was the idea? Yeah. And and is, and there's different. been president after president. Yeah, it is different, but it it's still the same mindset that it's this presidency that it's going to happen. And yeah. in this time, I've seen that. Yeah. 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 This time, but particularly, we, we do have other things to consider, yeah. but yeah, I don't see it either. The what you're yeah, saying. You, That's you, what you, you said. I don't yeah. believe that this president is going to bring in the Sunday law. That's what William was asking about. That's what you said. I don't believe. Well, I didn't say that, but. Um, well, actually, you did. I think we'll have to go back on the recording, Your Honor. <laughs> <laughs> well, you can go back. Uh, but I, that's not what I was talking about. I wasn't talking about any particular president. Um, I was talking about the fact that um, when we're when we're looking at this issue, this issue of picking a particular president that wasn't really how we looked at it before. We didn't look for a president that was going to do it. We were looking at what the religious right was doing. It was sort of the United States was going to do this, right? That's, that is because we would have to have the Constitution changed and all these things would happen. So we weren't looking at the character of a particular president as bringing in the Sunday law, right? But now we do. Right. So there's been a change within how we look at uh, the Sunday law issue. So, I mean, that, that's the main thing I'm trying to say here. Yeah, there's, I agree with you. Yeah, I agree with you. Yeah. You know, because I remember that time period. It was in the early 90s when the religious right was trying to, um, um, I think, insert their authority into the um, Congress of the United States. Right. So so we recognize it have to do with Congress, right? Not so much the president. But I think part of it is that the president has gained so much power. See, in the past, the president wouldn't have had the ability to do that, right? You know, just a president on his own. You need the Congress. That's right. That's right. Well, you also see uh, Congress. Yeah, Congress. I tell people this, but I believe it's true that Two thirds of the Congress, if they vote in Sunday law, it's law. They don't have to do nothing with the president. The president don't have to sign nothing. Well, the president has veto power. For the Constitution to be changed, there has to be a certain number of states. Is that right, William? Is that how it works? Yeah, it has to be. It has to be. I think two thirds of Congress. And I think there have been times in in the recent past where they've suggested amendments to the Constitution, but once that can of worms is opened, the the fear was 
among Adventists, if that was open, that they, someone could suggest a, an amendment to come in and suggest a Sunday law med, amendment. Uh, Ellen White was talking about the, what was it, the religious legislation that was suggested back then and how that should have arose us to to action. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. So, but, but you see the point of what we're talking about, that, that within Adventism, people are putting off this idea because of all the things that have happened, you know, all of the false predictions. And it's like, well, you know, the Lord delayeth his coming, you know, eat, drink, be merry, that type of thing. Right. So uh, the question is, what are we specifically told or warned not to do? There is a time of trouble coming to the people of God, but we are not to keep that constantly before the people and rein them up to have a time of trouble beforehand. There is to be a shaking among God's people, but this is not the present truth to carry to the churches. Now, of course, we'd have to take mm -hmm. that in context of, of, you know, obviously you can't just constantly keep people whipping, whipping people up about, you know, what's going to happen. I think that's part of the mistake of, of why people are so uh, inoculated to, uh, uh, you know, talking about end time events, because there has been a lot of undue excitement about everything, you know, ever since I've been an Adventist, what's going to happen. Um, and so we don't really focus so um, much on the sensational aspects of end time events as really what is what we need to prepare for. Right. So, you know, you think mm -hmm. back to Y2K. I mean, I know people who were preparing for Y2K and and it's like, well, there's a lot of things that have to happen first. Um, and, and of course, I knew the computers wouldn't, you know, crash and cause the end of the world or anything. But, but um, uh, you know, so there is understanding the pro the progress of events and how they unfold. And as we pass through them, that watching and waiting is necessary. But if you if you if you say that an enemy is a watchman, if you say, you know, an enemy comes, an enemy comes when there is, you know, just some dust in the off in the horizon and you continually do this. Well, then people eventually stop heeding what the watchman is saying. Right. Uh, one of the watchmen that I was speaking with uh, was a young intern pastor and. He gave this sermon on end time events and so on, and I thanked him for it. I said, "Man, it's been so long since I've heard sermons like this about this." And he, I hope you give more of them. And he said, "Well, I would get in trouble." Mm -hmm. So, so the idea why why God's people are asleep as well is because the watchmen haven't been warning them. The the pastors are to give encouraging sermons and not bring before the people the time of trouble ahead so much yeah. perhaps in a prophecy somewhere yeah but not in our pulpits from sabbath to sabbath it's, well yeah, I, the message isn't i yeah, haven't I, heard a message on preparation for the final crisis hardly ever yeah um there are stormy times before us but let us not utter one word of unbelief or discouragement in view of the pro approaching crisis, what should we be doing now? Be doing uh, 5T717. If God has ever spoken by me, the time will come when you will be brought before councils, and every position of truth which you hold will be severely criticized. The time that so many are now allowing to go to waste should be devoted to the charge that God has given us of preparing for the approaching crisis. And, and I think that should be really the emphasis, not so much all of the events and how soon it's coming, uh, but the preparation that's needed. And um, let me see here. So uh, we'll read this one. Who only will stand through the last great conflict? None but those who have fortified the mind with the truths of the Bible will stand through the last great conflict. Great Controversy 593. Study your Bible as you have never studied it before. Unless you arise to a higher, holier state in your religious life, you will not be ready for the appearing of the Lord, 5T717. We are approaching stormy times. Every position of our faith will be searched into. And if we are not 
thorough Bible students established, strengthened, and settled, the wisdom of the great, the world's great men will lead us astray. 5T 546. Uh, great Controversy 625 says only those who have been diligent students of the scriptures and who have received the love of the truth will be shielded from the powerful delusion that may that takes the world captive. Okay, so that, that's the end of that section. <clears throat> So we know we need to be studying the scriptures. We know that we have to have a deeper religious conviction in life. Um, that we have to have a love of the truth. And that a delusion is coming that's going to take the world captive. And, and many of us are already caught in that delusion. You know, one is, you know, that, that everything's okay. Um, so... I, I thought I put the, the pamphlet on the Unity chat, didn't I? Yeah, that was your man. It's on man. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, if you want to get this. Yeah. We we'll already put it there. Okay. Any final thoughts before we close with prayer? Five testimonies, page 707. Uh, paragraph. I have been shown that many who profess to have a knowledge of present truth know not what they believe. They do not understand the evidences of their faith. They have no just appreciation of the work for this time, this pre for the present time. When the time of trial shall come, there are men now preaching to others who will find, upon examining the positions they hold, that there are many things for which they can give no satisfactory reason. Until thus tested, they knew not their great ignorance and there are many in the church who take it for granted that they understand what they believe. But until controversy arises, they do not know their own weakness. When separated from those of like faith and compelled to stand singly and alone to explain their belief, they will be surprised to see how confused are their ideas of what they had accepted as truth. Five testimonies. Yeah. Yeah. This, this, seven, 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 seven. Yeah. So this idea that people are confused, I see all the time. That is, um, people try to discuss things on Facebook. They try to articulate things. Um, they, they don't know what they're talking about. Uh, many Adventists, uh, even people who try to support the 2300 days, don't really understand the issues involved because they've only heard what, you know, they've seen in evangelistic series or read in in books, and they've never studied it out themselves. So, so when our when our ministers themselves tell them there's no basis for the 2300 days and the 70 weeks, um, they're not going to know what to do. And and for many, it won't. The time will be too late to study because they've uh, already they've, they've 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 aligned themselves with error in so many different ways in their lives. That they won't have the ability to get oil in their vessels. Right? Mm. Uh, the, the, reading reading things like that used to get me quite wound up and anxious. You know, I got to know everything. I have to know everything. And uh, the thing is, we we know more than we know we know. But like I I can't recall at will everything that I've ever read or studied. But I I've been surprised at myself when when controversy arises say just with a friend uh from a different belief or whatever and the things that come out of my mouth uh quoting scripture and ideas and thoughts when my one friend i was speaking with his his dad who was opposing me and uh, i just calmly kept saying these things from scripture and my friend later said to me, I've never seen my dad speechless like that before. <laughs> and, uh, of course, he came back. He came back later and said, I've got some stuff for you now. I was talking to my pastor. so, <laughs> But never did get an opportunity to have that conversation. But we are more prepared than we think we are because as the Bible promises, as God promises, that the Holy Spirit will bring us to mind. Well, yeah, but there are people who have not really studied. They haven't really read. Um, they've just listened and and passively, and and think that yeah. they're not right. 
Um, cause you've studied. I was, I, I was looking at, you know, I, I was looking at the gla- glass half full side of it. Yeah. Okay. But yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah I, mean, I have I, studied for years, like with you, you, you know, I mean, it's, yeah. even when I was running from God, I was still reading and listening and it, it was quite a dichotomy. Yeah, I know. Yeah. So, okay. Well, let's close with prayer. Dear Father in heaven, thank you again for the Sabbath and for the blessings of fellowship. We ask for your angels to watch over each one of us. That you can keep us this week uh, from the trials that we are going to face and that we can study your word uh, with a new vigor uh, to recognize that there are things in our lives that need to change and that uh, we are unprepared for the time that is coming upon this world. Be with us in our individual study. Be with us in in the studies that we have in the morning. And uh, we ask, Lord, that we can represent you this week. But again, thank you for the Sabbath. May we enjoy your presence throughout this day. And we pray and ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.